Whew. Okay. I I think I think we got this. Did we get this? Is it working? Can you hear me? Let's make sure. You guys are going to be my my helper doodles. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I'm doing stuff. And saying things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can hear me. Now, can you still hear me? I am talking. I'm screen sharing. Making sure. Yep. That is the correct input. <laughs> oh, VS Code. Well, I, I can't. It won't let me um, VS Code do the thing. Let me turn this uh, monitor. There we go. That's better. Okay. So, back to main. Okay. Oh boy, this is this has been fun. StreamYards died. I can't add an audio input live. So I had to kill the stream to add an audio input. <laughs> this is just fun. This is why StreamYard should never die. StreamYards, um, please never break again. That's, um, <laughs> it's whatever. We're here. It's the third stream. Uh, we'll see how long this one works. I think we've lost everybody. They're like, I give up on this. But I'm still here. 
Still brought to you by Donnie. Printed in that printed solid green slime filament. It's got those sparkles in there. So, we're still here. Still got all the motors. Still got my NeoPixels. Still got this MMU thing. Yeah, I wish it was user error. I, I would have loved to be able to blame me on it because it's just like, that would be simple. But StreamYard is being a poop and my OBS wasn't set up uh, with my new headset. I set up the main camera, but I never set up screen share and it doesn't didn't want to port over my audio settings I had already done. So it works now. It's whatever. Um, screen sharing works. Um, I can use my uh, stream deck now, which is nice. So let me put the stream deck. That's the only thing I kind of miss when I stream versus stream yards. Quality should be higher because I can go higher than 720p now. Um, Tristan, it just depends. Um, 0 0.9 versus 1.8. Um, I get a little bit better print quality on the 0 0.9, but if you're using like a stock Prusa, it's really hard to push that 0 0.9. It's better to just stick with a 1.8. If you got something like these SKRs that are all printing back here, 32-bit uh, boards, um, you can throw on whatever. You can put a 0.1 motor on there. Should run just fine. Okay. <sighs> yeah, the stream should be fine now. Everyone share links to the stream. That way, maybe some people will find us. Um, let me hit the screen capture button. Let me know if the audio still works. Let me scroll back to home base. Actually, let me control Z. I can undo my settings. There we go. Okay. Let's see here. So. Last time we were all together, we played along with this thing called configuration.h. We went very in-depth. We hit a lot of really good topics, but um, it's not done. We have to go beyond configuration.h. We have to go to configuration adv.h, and it's super exciting. It should be much faster. Um, hopefully, it's much faster. Um, I'll try to hit the areas that are more important with uh, a little bit more detail and then areas that aren't very important I'll give you less detail. Uh, first things first we have to skip a bunch of this because none of this has anything to do with anything we're going to change until we get to this thermal protection area. So I adjust these values just based on the fact my fans are very powerful. So if you ever notice that you're printing and your fan kicks in and all of a sudden thermal runaway kicks in you could PID tune that pretty okay by doing a PID tune while running the fan. The issue is sometimes the thermal protection is just too tight. So if it, right here it's saying that if it drops more than four degrees and stays for four degrees for 40 seconds or longer, it just kills the whole thing and thermal protection kicks in. Um, for me, I tend to go to eight on this just give a little bit extra. Like if it goes to 10, yeah, you definitely want that to kick in. There should, there should be no reason while you're printing for more than 40 seconds at 10 degrees below. That means your heater's just not keeping up whatsoever. Um, there is adaptive fan slowing, which you know what? Let's go ahead and try that. So let's go ahead and set this to six instead of eight and we'll define adaptive fan slowing, which what that will do is it'll basically lower the fan speed if the temp decreases on the nozzle too far. That way it'll give it a little bit of a chance to catch up and then it'll kick the fan back on. So we'll try that, we'll see how that works. Um, yeah. And then the next thing we're gonna do is this watch temp and watch temp increase. So with the increase, you're gonna get false positives for heating fail and such when it takes too long to heat. I like to set this a little bit higher and this a little bit higher. So basically when you're heating um, and it's heating slowly, you're not going to get a false positive that heating failed. So just a little bit extra boost there. Thermal protection for the bed, I still leave it at 20 seconds because the only time your bed really should be cooled too much is like if you have something very small in the dead center of the bed and the fan kicks in. 
Uh, what I've been doing lately is not kicking the fan on until the third layer. There's no, there's usually no reason to have the fan kick on, you know, on the second layer. Third layer just means there's a little bit more plastic to protect it from the cooling. But I also do set this to about six degrees. So the swing doesn't kick in a false positive. And the same thing here with the increase. Um, I'm going to go with uh, six degrees as well. Or sorry, eight degrees. I'm going to copy my, my hot end. Um, so my temp period is going to be 30. My bed period is going to be 60 seconds with at least eight degrees of, uh, yeah, you got that. Thermal protection parameters for heated chamber. Guess what? We don't have a heated chamber, so we won't be messing with those. Uh, PID temp stuff, we're going to skip all the scaling stuff. We're going to skip all this, skip all this. We don't do any of this. Auto temp, skip that. We're getting really close. We're getting really close to something. Getting really close. There we go. So PWM fan scan. This is where we, this is where the video died last time. So what PWM fan scaling, let me hop back to my camera of me. Uh, this will be much easier for me to kind of show you. Let me grab a fan. I have boxes and boxes of fans. Um, where is this? Where is my boxes and boxes of fans? Is it down here? Is it this box right here? Yep. Here's my boxes of fans. So here's a fan. And I don't have any other brands in this box, do I? No. Just these. I didn't buy any spares. So when you have these big blower fans, uh, they tend to work uh, what's called PWM, where it's sending a pulse signal, and the signal tells it how much voltage to send to the fan. So when you're PWM scaling, that setting that we're showing you earlier, um, what's going on is it's sending that signal to tell it to, hey, send this many volts. So 0 to 255 or is 0 to 100% fan. So 0 to 255, 255 is max PWM, 0 is off. At least most fans, 0 is off. Um, if you notice when you're turning your fan on, and you start at like 5% and nothing happens, 10% nothing happens, 20% nothing happens, 30%, and so on and so forth. And then it kicks in like at a certain point. So uh, like this Winston fan or a Delta fan, even the Prusa fans on the Prusa printers, if you turn on it like 1%, nothing happens. It's not enough voltage to start the fan up. Same thing with um, these mechatronic fans and your revision. They won't turn on until they see 10 volts. And you'll see that their operating voltage is 10 to 24. Actually, it's 10 to 27. Uh, there's always a little bit extra there so it doesn't just burn out. That's where that setting comes in. So if you notice that when you put your printer together and all of a sudden you turn the fan to 30%, it doesn't do anything and it won't and it won't start until you go to 100% and go back down to 30, this is where you start trimming things. So we'll start to use math. So let's say, in our instance, I have a mechatronics fan. They will not kick in until it hits at least 10 volts. Um, that's a little bit less than, that's a little bit less than half of its max, or well, max that we can output, which is 24 volts. So if we go back to this setting, so let me go back to the screen capture. There is, um, yeah, it, it's kind of the pulse. There, there is a pulse fan. So Chris, it's a good thing. So uh, RepRap firmware has a thing where you can pulse it to 100 and bring it back down. What Marlin does is you can actually define a minimum PWM to start, and it scales it from there. So if I change this to 80, which is the setting I found, uh, we'll start the fan at about 5%. Uh, it will send, the minimum pulse that it will send will be about that 10 volts to start it. So it will scale it then. So it will then do its PWM. Its 1 is going to be 10 volts, and its 255 is going to be 24 volts, and it scales it. So now you have a new PWM range. So instead of starting at 0 volts and working its way slowly up, and it's not kicking in until about 30%, this will tell it to kick in at the 10 volts ish. This is where 80 is about 10 volts is what I found uh, when I measured it. Um, I didn't want to go exactly. I, you know, I still want it to kind of work like a regular fan where one, two, three really doesn't kick it in. Once you're at five uh, on the fan settings, 
it'll kick in and it'll run really slowly. Uh, you can also use this to run a 12 volt fan um, on a 24 volt system by limiting the max current to half. Yes, yeah, so some fans uh, just won't run below 50. It's uh, I have a Delta fan that won't run until you set it to 20. Um, so it's just every fan has a different minimum voltage to get it running. And I can actually test it on my benchtop uh, power supply. So what I've done is I hooked it up and I started ramping the voltage and it didn't kick in until that certain voltage. So unless you know what voltage it starts at, it's really tough, but you can kind of guess. There's no harm in increasing the minimum, but what's also cool is this max PWM setting. With the max PWM setting, if you had a 24 volt fan or a 20, 24 volt system and you run, want to run a 12 volt fan, you can cap the maximum PWM output, limiting it to zero to 12 volts. So you just use half a 255, so 128. So if I did this to find max 128, I can now run a 12 volt fan on a 24 volt system. Just make sure you don't have um, the um, uh, max pulse setting enabled. So there's a setting here where it will send a max pulse to start. Yeah, here's the, the kickstart. Um, it'll send a pulse, a max pulse to uh, start the fan. Don't turn that on because then it'll send 24 volts to the fan and then scale it back down. You can, uh, I ran a five volt fan for a while by scaling this max PWM down so it only output five volts. So it's pretty cool. Um, it's still better to run a 24 volt fan, but if you're in a pinch, you can do this and this will work. So we did had a couple beta testers that didn't have 24 volt fans. But because this printer has a mechatronics fan, I'm gonna set that fan minimum PWM to 80 because I know that's where it will start to run. And remember, all it's doing is taking that PWM signal and instead of starting it at zero and running it to 255 AK max 100%, it's going to start it at uh, whatever 80 is. So it's going to start it at like, yeah, it's going to start at 80 and run to uh, 255 instead of zero to 255. And you have, and you can still scale just like it normally would. So you're not limited. It just means that it's taking the PWM signal, shifting it over, and then expanding it to fit. So you still get all your ranges. So 50% is still 50% of max. It just moves that scale over. Um, and again, the other cool features, you can run a 5-volt fan. You can run a 12-volt on a 24. Um, you cannot go the other way. You can't run a 24-volt fan uh, with 24 volts. So you can't do a max. You can't go higher than, I, I mean, I wouldn't go higher than 255. So yeah, you can run fans. Um, yeah, so it says in here, or run lower current fans on uh, with higher current. So you can do that. Just don't go the other way. So um, that is your lesson on what this PWM setting does. <laughs> um, I don't mess with fast PWM frequency. I do know some people who mess with this. I haven't done it. Um, our next step is to set up which is our auto fan. So this is interesting on the SKR. Um, it has four fan in outputs. Um, three of them are only called 1224. So let me hop over to the internet. So since we're still screen sharing, let's hop over to uh, my GitHub. GitHub. And we'll go to this wiring guide and we'll scroll all the way down to the last page. And the wiring guide has one, two, three, and four pins. So you got fan zero, one, two, and three. Uh, we can't use more than fan zero because if you look at the fans, it says fan zero is 1224 and pin 2.3. Fan one is ground 1224. So all that's telling you is that this 1224 is whatever input voltage you have, it's only gonna do that. So you can't change its settings, you can't do anything. It's just, you can either plug a 12 volt fan if you're running 12 volt power, or you can run a 24 volt fan if you're running 24 volt power. Uh, what we need to do is we need to steal HE1. So we need to use the pin here because open, if we wanna have a fan that turns on at 50 degrees Celsius, like we're used to. So that way your fan isn't running, your extruder fan isn't running at all times. So uh, some boards will have more of these controllable fans. Uh, technically, you could also take fan one 
use the 1224 volt and then run a pin over to like the X stop or the, you know, one of these others. So you can stretch fans across. So if you wanted to run um, fan one, steal the 1224, sorry, 1224 is here. So this is the, the little red dot. And then if you stole the E1 pin here, uh, that should be right here. So this bottom one right here. So if you ran a fan and split it, you can run a fan and control it that way. You just have to know what the pin number is. So in our instance, it's pin 2.04 is what we're going to use. It's just easier. Uh, but if you want to split it, you can. Um, you would just use pin, if we look at E1, we would use pin 1.25 if we were going to do like that split. And you can do that anywhere. So, I mean, if you wanted to, you could wire, you know, fan 3 and do the same thing. If you have multiple fans that turn on and off um, when you need it, it's just, it's just no fun. Um, you can do the same thing by stealing 5 volt. Um, so if you stole 5 volt from some other pin over here, like the NeoPixel pin has a 5 volt out. Um, this has a 5 volt, out, 5 volt out here, so you can steal 5 volt in this pin. You can run a 5 volt fan by using this pin and this 5 volt. So whatever you want to do, uh, you can. Uh, just know for this instance, and the way that I've shown in the wiring guide, is to use E1. And do make sure you wire correctly. Positive is on the right, negative is on the left. And we need pin 2.04. So let's hop back over to here. So we need pin 2 underscore 04. So that's going to set our extruder auto fan that kicks on at 50 degrees Celsius um, correctly. So yeah, if we plug it into that port, Pin 204 will kick on at 50 degrees Celsius, and you can set your fan speed here. Uh, let's say you put a really, really powerful fan, or it's too loud, you could trim the maximum output. Um, I have an 8,000 RPM fan on one printer, and I did that same thing because I don't need it to run at 8,000, so I just lowered it to like 200 uh, because I didn't need it to run at 8,000 RPM. It was very loud. So you do have this fun options. Uh, just remember that your pin matters and you should 50 degrees Celsius is a great time to kick it in. I wouldn't change that and only change this. If you're doing something like I only have this ridiculously powerful fan to cool my extruder, I don't need it to run that high. So that's that for you. Uh, we don't need any of this. Um, we do need this section because we're enabling NeoPixels. So let me go back to me. So NeoPixels is an interesting thing. So um, here's your standard NeoPixel. We kind of talked about it in the 101 lecture. So all they are is individually addressable uh, LED lights. So I can literally say pixel one in this link be a one color. And it kind of does that. So when the bed's heating, um, this will turn blue and it'll go purple, purple. As it warms up, each pixel will individually change to purple until the entire bar is purple. When the hot end starts warming, uh, it'll start at blue and then go to red. So it'll go from blue to red, and each pixel will turn red as it starts to heat, and then once all the bars are filled, you've fully heated. When it begins to print, all the lights turn to white. It's pretty cool. Uh, Marlin added a menu so you can also control these. They don't give you the individual pixel, um, control, but they allow you to control the whole setup. So let's go back to that craziness. So we're going to enable the case. Oh, wait, this is, this is the case light that we want. I think there's another lighting section. Hold on. This is where it gets confusing. There's multiple LED. There's an LED menu. That yeah, we don't want that one. This is for case lights. So let's back up a little bit. This is the case light setting. So if you have case lights enabled, you would control it with this and MG code M355. We're going to skip this. We don't have case lights. But what I'm saying does still stand once we get to that section. We don't want any of this. We do have dual steppers. So you can use up to one to four uh, Z steppers. But we need, um, we need two. So remember when we set up our printer in configuration.h, if we scroll all the way back over to right and here, we set up a Z1 and a Z2. So that way we can do really cool things. 
So configuration advanced. We're going to go back to our thing here and say, hey, we've got two Z steppers. So this will unlock some settings. And if you want multiple end stops, you can. We don't have them. We're using a probe. Dual X carriage has some fun things. Uh, and then I wish the order was different here. So it jumps from dual X carriages, which we did here. Uh, well, we didn't do it. Uh, and then all of a sudden it jumps to home bumping. So we're using uh, sensorless homing on this printer. All sensorless homing does is measure uh, the current and it looks for a spike. So when it hits something and it bumps, there's a loss in step. Stall guard triggers and says, hey, I lost a step. And the current's rising, so this must be the end of my uh, travel. And boom, uh, it will shut down or it will just stop the axis and act like an end stop. One of the things that isn't working that well in Marlin is the bump where it hits goes off and then bumps again. And this is what that bump is. So if you have a printer and it hits the end stop, comes off the end stop and goes back to the end stop, that is what your home bump is. Um, we're gonna set this to zeros for the X and Y. You can do a bump for the, uh, uh, the Z homing, but we're not going to. But I will do a homing back off. So it's kind of like home bump. It just doesn't go back and re-home uh, again. What it's going to do is it's going to home and then back off the ends. So I like to bump off 2, 2, and 2 is just fine. So this just means that when it hits the x-axis end, it's going to come off the end by 2 millimeters. It's going to hit the y-axis end stop, come off 2 millimeters. And then it's going to hit the z-axis and then come off 2 millimeters once it's done finishes probing. You can actually set the back off to zero on Z probe, but I leave it all twos. Quick home is kind of neat. I leave it off for now because it was buggy for a second where it just would not home correctly. Um, it would home one axis, then not the other, and then it would do weird stuff. Um, it, what you do is when you enable this, it will home X and Y at the exact same time to save, you know, three seconds of your life. Um, I leave it off. It just means that it's going to home X, it's going to then home Y, and then it's going to home Z. If you turn this on, if you enable this, it's going to home X and Y at the same time, and then it'll home Z. So you can also enable to home Y before X and all this stuff, but we're, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. If you had a BL touch, here's all of your BL touch fanciness. So you can set a delay, you can force software mode. Um, I like to use um, high speed mode when I have my BL touch. I'll enable that. And you can notice that it is all darkened out because VS Code is awesome. I don't have a BL touch enabled, so this isn't here. If I go back to configuration.h and I go scrolling down here to probes and I enable a BL touch and I go back here, this will eventually pop in and now I can edit it. But we don't have a BL touch, so let's go ahead and comment that out. Uh, scrolling down. So this is where I wish this was in a different place. So here's Z-Stepper auto alignment, which has to do with our dual Z-Steppers. I really wish it went from dual X carriage and then had the Z-Stepper auto alignment before it went to all this other stuff. But, you know, uh, order of operations here. So let's go back to me. What is Z, Z alignment? So there's a couple different ways that you've probably seen aligning your Z axis. So um, one of the old school methods that I used to do on my uh, Monoprice Maker Select Plus uh, was to lower the gantry uh, while the power was off. And then I'd set two equal distant blocks and then I would you know, spin the wheels until the gantry, or spin the z-axis stepper until the gantry came down and sat on those blocks. And that would level your gantry to your bed. Pretty neat. I mean, that's kind of how it worked. When you, when you own a Prusa, Prusa uses sensorless homing to what's called, um, I think it's just z-calibration. What it does is just keep raising the z-axis until it hits the ends at the top and then ram into the top until it's level. Now, the issue with that uh, the logic there is um, 
your Z toppers supposedly are in line with your bed, and they're usually not. Um, so it's taking a reading and going, okay, it's, it's taking into account a lot of factors. It's taking into account that one, your printed parts, your Z axis ends, or your X axis ends, are actually perfectly level, and that the prints of the Z tops are perfectly level and they're screwed in perfectly level and everything hits. And then it's trying to take into account that all that is level to the bed. It's probably not in Marlin and rep rep firmware. So if you have a duet, um, you can probe closest to the left Z axis motor and the right Z axis motor, and it will line the gantry automatically for you. And I'll show you that in the next installment because the next installment video is compiling and uploading that firmware to the printer, and then I'll run you through all the cool features that we're doing. So when you do that Z auto align, it's taking into account that the bed might not be perfectly levelly, might not be leveled uh, perfectly to everything else. So it'll then level the actual extruder and everything else to the bed. It's a really cool system. I like it. I've seen no downfall to it. But you have to have two independent Z motors, and they have to be wired independently. So you can't have one stepper driver running two Z motors at the same time. You have to have, you know, the two motors, two steppers, so one stepper for each motor. That way, when you probe left and you probe right, they can independently move up and down. And it's actually fun to watch. So... That's what that setting is, um, in as much long speak as I can use. So let's go back to me. We're going to find Z stepper auto align, but I don't know what the settings are. Um, I do know that we only have a Z1 and a Z2, so we're actually we're just going to go ahead and delete this. I'm going to add these values in myself uh, when we do this now. Probe limits can be used automatically if you don't want to define them. I tend to define them, but for now, we're just going to leave this completely undefined. And here's our different versions that we can use. Zero does left and right, and one does up and down. Uh, we're just going to keep all this stuff the way it is. So stepper orientation, zero. So pretty simple stuff, because this is how it is. Start from the beginning. No, Josh, I can't do that. Uh, we don't need any of these other settings for it. None of them. You can do things like you can set the alignment accuracy, uh, how many iterations. I usually do four iterations. Five is fine. Whatever you want to do works. Uh, we'll leave it at the five, and I'll show you all that fun stuff when we get there. Uh, we don't need this. We do need this. So this is an interesting section. So, you know, sometimes you'll end a print and then your Z-axis can move afterwards. There's a timeout. Um, and unaligning your Z-axis after we've spent all that time aligning it is a pain in the butt. So what we do is we turn off this Z-inactive, disable Z-inactive, set it to false. What that means is when the printer stops printing and it's been inactive for a while, um, your x-axis, your y-axis, and your extruder will all disable. So that way you can move the x and y and e. You can even turn all these off. Uh, you can set a different time for them if you want. But for me, I do not want my z-axis to ever unenable. That way it's not going to accidentally get bumped and unaligned because I spent all that time aligning my z-axis. So uh, I do that. <laughs> and... Don't need any of this. Don't need any. I do want to start messing with backlash compensation. I'll have to read into it and see how to set it up and maybe do a video just on that. Uh, I don't need any of this. And I do want this. So since we're running TMC drivers, um, adaptive step smoothing does make them sound a little quieter. So I do highly recommend setting your adaptive step moving to on if you have a TMC driver enabled. If you're running A9, A4988s or A9, whatever those are, those really cheap, loud, or other drivers, I don't recommend turning these on. We skip all this stuff. Skip it, skip it, skip it, skip it. Uh, LCD menu. I love having the LCD info menu because that's where your printer info is. So remember when we we're back here 
and we'll scroll down and scroll down. I really wish I memorized the lines. I know where they're at when I see it. Uh, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. So right here, print counter. You can't have print counter because it's stored in the LCD info menu. So we need to enable the LCD info menu. Uh, so yeah, definitely have this enabled in order to have this work. So they'll have your what firmware version you're using and when that firmware was made and uh, your author info and all the other fun stuff. Uh, it's all in there as well as the print counter info. Uh, I don't do the turbo back menu item. Um, here is the LED control. So remember I was kind of going on about NeoPixels and I was in the wrong section. Here we are. So LED control menu and enable that just means there'll be a new menu added so you can control those NeoPixel LEDs. You can also do some cool stuff. So um, you can set your preset like values for colors, for whatever. Um, you can also do a preset as a startup. So what I like to do, since I don't have a white pixel, zero, and brightness 255, I do have my favorite color to use is purple. So we'll do max red and max blue, 255. And that will give us a purple color. If you want green to be your um, preset color, you just zero out red, zero out blue, and 255 on the green. If you want red, same thing. You know, And you can mix and match whatever color intensities you want. So if you want a redder purple, remove some blue. If you want a bluer purple, remove some red. So whatever you want, you can do. Um, and then this preset startup just means that when your printer is ready to go, it's always going to snap back into your preset color. So if you ever look back at my printers behind me, when not printing, the lights are always purple. This is why they're always purple. We do want status message scrolling. It just means when there's a long status message, it'll scroll and let us know. Um, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba, LCD timeout to status. We enable that. Basically, it'll send us back to the status screen after we've sat too long in the menu, which is awesome. And you can enable this. Some people like to do this. It'll show the E position, the filament used during printing. I haven't enabled it myself, but it is an option for you. Uh, we don't have a graphical display, so none of that matters. Uh, we don't need any of this. We don't need any of this. Uh, power loss detection. I'm going to do, I thought about this. I'm going to do a lecture just on power loss detection. Because, yeah, it's its, it's own long and involved process. Sort SD card, we do want this. So this just allows us to sort our cards, our SD cards, depending on whatever we want. So, um, you know, name or um, whatever. So this just allows that. Um, scroll long file names, heck yeah. That just means that when you have a file name that's more than the screen length, which is 20 characters on here, uh, it'll scroll it. So you can read what the whole file name is once you hover on it. And we skip all this, we skip all this, we don't have a flash drive, we don't have SD firmware updating, we don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have a graphical display. If we did, we can do cool stuff like or overlay a graphic so you can see the uh, clockwise and counterclockwise movement. Can't do any of this. There's even games. If you have games, you can... Um, or if you have a screen that's got graphics, you can run games on it. I've been I played a lot of Brickout on my screen. It was fun for like a minute. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're there. Uh, da -da -da, scroll through, scroll through. Don't mess with Watchdog. Always leave Watchdog. Baby stepping. So baby stepping, if you come from Prusa Land, is your uh, live Z. So baby stepping is basically um, your probe is at a point, and you want to lower your probe. There's a little menu that pops out that allows you Z or allows you to baby step. The downfall of baby stepping is baby stepping isn't permanent. It is permanent when we define um, where is it? When we do this, when we define baby step Z offset, it combines it. So what it does is now you're you're now you're going to adjust your Z probe offset. So when you do like you're doing a print and you're like, oh, this is a little high and you lower it. It's going to store that value um, and in um, in EEPROM, in, but you do have to M500 to permanently save it. So just remember that you have to define baby stepping and the define Z probe offset together 
in order to get this correct. So do that. You can also define double click for Z baby stepping. So it means when you're printing, you can double click your home button uh, or whatever your, your button is. And it will go right to the baby stepping menu. And you can also enable this. So when you're at your home screen, so when you're not printing and you double click your main button, it'll take you to move Z, which is pretty cool. It's kind of like the Prusa feature. So if you have a Prusa Mark 3S, if you press and hold the main button for three seconds, it'll automate, automatically take you to the move the Z option. So kind of a neat feature, but this is how I set it up. I always enable baby stepping. I always enable double click for baby stepping. I always enable move Z. And then I also always do the baby step Z probe offset because that combines baby stepping and Z probe offset, which is awesome. Multiply one millimeter by this factor for the move step. Let's do 10. You know, I've never actually looked at that. So it's going to move it by 10 millimeters. That's perfect. That way it's not super slow. And scroll down. Linear advance. There's a long informational thing on linear advance. Let me hop back to me. So what is linear advance and why do we like linear advance? So linear advance is a built-in, uh, I guess, I guess to put it in, in simple terms, it's um, on chip, on the board itself, it's calculating the spring constant of the material or actually the how much it needs to stop extruding before it hits a corner or point so it matches the spring constant of the material. So if you ever notice that when you finish printing and the nozzle moves away, material still is shooting out. And that's because when you retract, you actually cause some back pressure because the material is like a spring when it's in this molten state. So you'll retract and the material still wants to shoot out. What that value is, is the spring constant of the material. So PLA is, you know, a, has a certain amount of springiness to it when it's molten versus PTG versus ABS. Hence why you're always tuning these settings. Most PLA should be all pretty darn close to each other. Most ABS should be all pretty darn close to each other. Just different materials tend to be different. ABS tends to be very similar to PLA. Uh, but every material you have will have a different constant. That's why it's a K value, which is the spring constant uh, value. And all that allows you to do is when you've tuned it correctly, um, the board will calculate coming up to that point where it needs to stop extruding. So it hits a zero point where there's no extrusion, there's no material coming out of the nozzle. And then it'll hit the turn or hit the point and then move and then it begins extruding again. So you get sharper corners, you don't get that bulge in the corner of your, of your print. So like if you look at like this cube, you can see it has nice sharp corners because of the fact that I have linear advance enabled. If you don't tune it correctly, you'll either have a corner that has no material in it or you'll have a corner that's very bulgy and round. So those are your um, those are your your little tips on that. So Marlin has a website dedicated to allowing you to run a G code and it'll print this little diagram so that way you can uh, tune your um, K values. What I like to do is I'll define linear advance and I'll set the value at zero. And all this means is it's just disabled. A value of zero just means off. And this will allow you to um, adjust it in your slicer G code. So in your start G code, you would do an M900 space, a K, and then the value for your spring constant. And since they're using linear advance 1.5, your value uh, will be less than one. So just know that this value will not be a high number. It'll be a low number. For most PLA I print, it's 0 0.4. For most PETG I print, it's 0 0.10. But this all has to do with, hey, what's up, Shauna from Slice? Uh, it just has to do with what type of hot end you have. So if you have a direct drive extruder, your values would be much lower because it's taking into account the amount of uh, Bowden tube that goes in between as well. So if you have a Bowden setup, 
values uh, of you know 0 0.3, 0 0.4 probably could happen. Define probe points are probably kind of cool. So if you want to do a uh, leveling and actually make your own probe points, you can. Um, ba -ba -bum, ba -ba. We don't need any of this. Probe temp compensation. So we have a probe. Let me scroll up to it. We have a probe that has a temp sensor, and this is where it gets defined. So if I left this thing zero, this should clear itself out. So we have this. No, I hit F1 instead of one. One. This will now re-enable. Uh, we don't have to mess with anything here. It's good to go. What's up, Dan? Uh, G2, G3 arc support. Don't worry about it. G38 probe. Nope, nope. Don't need any of this. Don't need any of this. Don't need any of this. Yeah, definitely don't mess with this stuff. Like, this is all done automatically. I know a lot of people started messing with this, but nope, this is all automagic. Leave that alone. You can mess with the things they're having issues. So here's a fun fact. Um, are you having issues with your printer not keeping up with stuff? Well, if you have a 32-bit board, you can raise all these buffers up much, much higher. So... You can go to 32 and buff size 32 and transfer buff size to 32. So this will allow you to have much larger blocks. People have tested 64 and it works fine. 32 is safe. All we're doing here is increasing cam on you. Oh, cam on me, not code. I can change that. Let me see. Where did I change anything? Okay. So back here, let me control Z, Z, Z. So here is the buffer sizes. So this is in your buffers. Uh, the SKR boards have a much larger uh, ability. Well, they just they can just buff more things. They have a much larger processor. They can handle more things. So your buffer size actually increases. So you definitely want to increase those three values. So your buffer size, your buffer size, and your transfer buffer size. So those can all go to 32. Uh, we don't need anything else. We don't need any of this. We don't need any of extra that. We don't need firmware attract. We don't need any of this. We will define advanced pause feature. And we'll also scroll all the way down once that's done to park head on pause because we enabled. Guess what? Pausing. If we do park, 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 park. It's here. I know it is. Where are you? Oh, is it after bed leveling? Control F, park. Nozzle park. We define nozzle park so we can park our head on any pauses. So if you have an M600, you want to do a color change, boom, it'll park it. Uh, we definitely want the filament load and unload G codes. And filament unload on all extruders, no. So good to go here. These values, I will show you what they do later. Uh, Mark, I Amazon, their official AliExpress, wherever you can pick up your SKR14. Uh, these values I'm going to leave blank because I'm going to show you another program where I'm going to steal these values from. And here's where we get to the fun stuff. This is where we're going to have a long conversation on things. So we're going to scroll down until we get to the the actual drivers we want, which are these to use 2130s, blah, 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 5160s. Oh, 2208s, also 2209s. So here's where we're going to be setting our currents and our homing currents and all that fun stuff. So let me back out to me because this topic is involved. This is probably the most involved topic we have on here. Um, we're using what's called UART. So there's two different communication methods. Well, three. There's the communication mode called standalone, which means there's no communication. It just means the driver itself. So let me pull a driver out. So something like these A4988s. Why isn't it opening? There we go. They don't really talk. They just do their thing. There's a little potentiometer on there, and you would take the board and you'd move little pins around, little uh, jumpers, and it says, okay, now it's doing this because of this jumper, and voila. You can do the same thing on 2208s. You can do the same thing on 2209s. 
if you so desire. Um, but we're using fancy technology. And I know it's scary. Uh, the llama would say, I don't want to use it. Uh, but we're going to use it. We're going to make it and it's going to work because it's awesome. And why do we do this? So instead of using the standalone dummy mode, um, we want to use uh, this feature called you are in this chip because it allows us to set the current directly in the firmware. It allows us to do sensorless homing. It allows us to send do all kinds of fun stuff, changing our micro stepping right in G code. Um, the importance of this is one, it's, it's easier. You, you already have to make your firmware. So why not just do it in firmware versus, um, you know, going, okay, I want to change this value and then going back into firmware and changing stuff. Cause if you were like, let's say I wanted to go from one sixteenth to one eighth micro stepping, you still have to change your firmware. You still have to change your M92. So you, you, you pull the stepper driver out, you'd move the pins, uh, the jumper pins out, you'd stick the driver back in, and then you still have to go back and change your micro stepping value. Of course you can do that in EEPROM, but you still would change it in your firmware because you changed it. We can do that in the firmware. So let's hop over here and take a look at what we got. So the first thing you're going to see is if axis is TMX at TMCX, we can set our current. So how do we set our current? How do we know what current to start with? This is a very important question that gets asked a lot. Um, my rule of thumb, and actually, well, so the, the rule of thumb with all stepper drivers uh, and motors is to not run past two thirds of its maximum capacity. Uh, they begin to get hot. If you ever notice your stepper driver is getting hot, they're either being overworked, so that means that they're not enough torque and it's really, really working the driver out or the stepper out, or your current is too high. And if you have to run your current at near max in order to move, you need to move up a stepper driver size. So if you got a pancake on your extruder and it's getting super hot and it won't run unless you're at maximum current, uh, you need to move to a full size stepper or something maybe in between. Um, same thing with X and Y. So if your X axis is burning hot and you've got this huge dual extruder swinging around and you're like, wow, why is it so hot? When I lower it, it doesn't move. And I have to have that. So you really just need to uh, increase this. And what you basically do is uh, you look at your, your driver and you go, okay, I got this LDO motor in front of me. It says it's uh, one amp. There's a one amp motor. So I'm going to start it at 800. That's fine. And I can work my way down. Um, I know what value it works at. It actually works at uh, 400 milliamps. I just know. You don't. Again, these motors don't have to run at full power in order to move your axis. But for you guys, start at you know two thirds of your max value and work your way down. If it's warm, keep going down. If you're skipping steps, go up. Your next setting here is your that I'm going to talk about is the micro stepping and this just says instead of so you remember how we talked about motors have two the 1.8 degree motor had 200 steps you can have it kind of have more steps so you can multiply that by 16 so instead of 200 it has uh whatever 200 times 16 is which is three three thousand two hundred steps why do we do this it makes the motion smoother but there is a point of no return. So you could set your micro steps from 16 to 64 or 128 or 256. And people are like, why not? It's smoother. Well, it is smoother, but we have to go back to science. So let's go back to me and let me grab this thing that I've pulled apart. Arr, come here. These magnets are strong. There we go. So your motor, your hybrid stepper motor has teeth. Oh, come on. Focus on my hand. There you go. It has those teeth. And all a, all a step is, is when those teeth match up with those teeth in there, and it moves, and it goes to the next full tooth, that's one full step. Micro stepping pauses it in between. And it's kind of interesting. Um, if you look at the actual teeth on this, you'll see that they're off step. So there's one step in between the other step. And this allows us to do micro stepping. So 
you'll have a one tooth fully in between another one, and then on the other half, it's on the actual side. So it's like this, and the other setup behind it is here. So your one tooth is here, the other tooth is set up here, and it matches. So you get um, uh, the ability to micro step. The issue with that is, is when you're in between, uh, you don't have as much torque. The only time you have full torque is when you are tooth on tooth. So when the this strator and the rotor and the teeth are in line, you have maximum torque. So you look at the motor, and they'll usually tell you a torque value. Um, this one has 40, yeah, this one is uh, 40 newton meters. So, not newton centimeters, 0.4 newton meters. Um, but when it's in between, it's less. So when a tooth is in a valley, you have very little torque. So if you did 256 microstepping, that tooth can pause anywhere in between that gap. And I'm, I'm showing a very large gap here. Um, the gap is more tiny and the teeth are much smaller and there's very little torque for them. Um, and they could just not move. So if you set it to one 256 micro step or 256 micro stepping physically, and you try to move one two fiftieth of the two fifty sixth of a step, it's not going to move. It's just not enough power to do it. So now we have to go back. I know this is starting to get complicated. So what about the interpolated two fifty six micro stepping? Isn't my motor moving at one hundred or one two at two fifty six micro stepping because I'm using a uh, TMC driver? The answer is no, but yes. So what interpolation does, what a TMC driver does, and why it's so quiet, is you still are using that 16 or 32 or 8 micro steps, but when it sends the pulse to move, because remember, it's not sending one individual pulse for move. It's not like, boom, move this much, boom, move this much. It's like, okay, I need to move 5 millimeters, pulse to 5 millimeters. It's, it, that's how the motor works. Um, so when you have that interpolated, all it's doing is, okay, I have 1 16th micro stepping. That's what my firmware says I have. So I can move in 1 16th steps. So between this, this, uh, this rotor or this point and this point, I can move in 1 16th steps. But I'm going to send a pulse at 256. So it's defining its ability to micro step. So you still have 1 16th micro stepping. So your accuracy is still whatever one sixteenth of that step is but your pulse is going to be a pulse that's generated to move at 256 micro steps so you don't have more resolution you have better sound quality at a expense of increased heat and decreased uh yeah increased heat and decreased uh sound so you get a quieter motion with more heat and the same accuracy. You do not gain. You, when when I hear people say, I've got a TMC driver, I'm running at 256 micro steps, you are not. You're running at whatever you are set at, which is one to one, one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, most likely one sixteenth. Um, and the pulse is just a smoother pulse. So instead of being a big jaggedy pulse, it's just nice one smooth pulse that moves you from point A to point B. Uh, you also lose a little bit of torque in this because that pulse isn't as strong as a regular non-interpolated um, pulse. The amount of torque lost is not negligible, but it's not enough to cause issues. So not like if we were to actually physically set our, our uh, x-axis to be at 1 256. We lose a ton of torque trying to move at 1 256 of a micro step because most likely it will just not move and stay in place. So that is your really long and involved lesson on micro stepping, which I should probably make an entire, entire class on with giant props and printed out gears and things that spin. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's micro stepping and that's, that's the, the benefits and negatives and positives. So why do we take TMC drivers? They're quieter. They allow smoother motion, which means less artifacting on our prints 
at a loss of overall torque, which is a negligible amount of torque. I don't like saying negligible in this instance, but it is a negligible amount of torque. Um, but you also increase a little bit of heat because you're sending a much broader pulse that the motor has to keep up with um, and stuff like that. So that is your science 101 of micro-stepping, uh, which should be its own course. Um, yeah, so you're... You're welcome for completely confusing you and making you feel a lot less intelligent than you walked in, because that probably was pretty barbaric, but that's why we're here. We're here to learn. Um, so let's go back. So we're going to leave this at 16 microstepping. stepping R-sense value. What is this R-sense value? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had props. My only props are disassembled motor. Um, R-Sense value is a chip that is on the driver. Most TMC drivers have an R-Sense of 0.11. Some are different. Like if you look at the Prusa, their R-Sense is higher, which is 2.2. If you look at a TMC uh, 5160, it is actually 0.075, I believe. So we leave this at 0.11. And this chain position doesn't matter. And there is one that I've skipped because it is another involved topic. So let's hop back to me. This is real fun. We're just having all these involved topics. So I wish I had a printer that I can just swing around right now. So sensorless homing. Homing. What is the homing current? So how does sensorless homing work? Sensorless homing works in that it measures, it uses a tool called StallGuard, and it also measures the current being output, or the current usage of the of the driver. So when your driver is spinning, it it's, it's pretty free spinning. I mean, your x-axis is smooth, your y-axis is smooth, your, your extruder is pretty smooth, uh, but there's things, uh, there's a change in amperage that is a peak and a valley. And when you hit something that's solid with a motor, your current increases and your steps begin to skip. And stall guard and sensorless homing measure those. So when you get a peak ask of current and the amperage increases and the steps begin to skip and it's reading those skip steps, it's like you hit the end of something. But all of those have to align at the same time. And that's where people have issues with tuning sensorless homing because, let's go back to the actual issue, they don't change this value. Oop, control Z. They don't change this. They leave the value that you're homing the same value that you're normally moving. Uh, you want a lower current. Typically, my instruction for you is to have this. So again, we can use math in, uh, in VS Code. So all I'm doing is saying that my homing current is half of my actual current. So homing is going to be 200 milliamps versus the 400 milliamps of my axis. Or if I change this to 500, it's going to be 250. Um, this is a great starting point. So, I mean, you can even type in 250 or 200. You can set whatever you want. Just do not have it equal to... This, this does not work. You, it's going to be really hard for the um, stall guard and the drivers and all that to align because you're, you're forcing the full current while you're homing. You want it to be able to sense that stall. So if you're at full current trying to home, you know, especially on a printer that needs more current. So if you needed 800 milliamps, good luck at ever realizing that you needed more current to continue moving and it's stalling. It's just going to keep... You know, it's going to keep spinning and other things are breaking. So uh, lower that down. Uh, we'll start at one half. I actually know the regular value and we'll add that in later. And we'll set this thing back to, I'll just say 500 for now. Let's go back to the y-axis. So this is where other people get this wrong. Your x-axis and y-axis typically don't have the exact same uh, current needs because your x-axis is only moving your extruder, which tends to be very light and small. Your y-axis is typically heavy. It has a carriage and a bed. Some of those beds, when it's like a uh, CR10 or, a, or the S5, where it's a 500 by 500 glass bed, is extremely heavy. So your current should be higher. Your current should always be higher on your y-axis, unless the weight of your y-axis is the exact same weight 
and motion of your x-axis. So uh, I'm usually at about 100 to 150 more milliamps uh, higher. So 600 is where we're going to say. And we're going to do the same thing with the y current homing is going to be half. And this should allow you to home your x and y on a motor that's about one amp. Now these values will change. So again, if you had a two amp motor, uh, you would probably start at like 1.2 amps. Now remember this also uh, takes into account what driver you have. If I had a 2208, I can't go past one point, like four amps. Uh, because I have a 2209, I can go up to two amps. If I had a 5160, I could run, what is it, five amps, five and a half amps. So again, this is where it gets real tricky. If you need more current, um, you know, pay attention to your driver. If you're running these at 100%, you might have to put more active cooling. So uh, these are just general guidelines for a, a well-made one amp motor on a standard Cartesian printer. Your values will most likely be different. Just know when you're tuning them, if it's skipping steps and you're like getting lost steps, you're printing and it's like skipping, most likely you have to increase your current. Jump by 50s. Don't jump by 200s. Jump by 50, rerun the print, see if it's skipping. Um, same thing with if it's too hot. If the motor's running too hot, that might mean too much current. Lower the current by 50 until it no longer is above 40, 40 45 C is about where I would say, yep, we're good. It, once it's reaching 50, 60 C, you need to start lowering your current on your on your X and Y axis. Our Z axis, I know this value, it's going to be 400. And we don't need to change the homing current because we're not homing with our Z axis. You could lower this so that way if you crash into the bed, it's less damage. So like, there's no reason not to do this, but um, I'm still going to leave it 400 and leaving the Z as, as it's the same current. Um, our extruder. Now this is very dependent on things. Um, I'm leaving this at 16 because I have a 3.5 to 1 gear motor on there. I don't need 32 micro stepping. So I don't need, was that, 1960 <laughs> steps. Um, but my current is still going to be a little bit lower. I go to about 650 on this motor to run. Uh, it's a pancake motor with a 3.5 to 1 planetary gear. It's a one amp motor, 650 is pretty good. It gets to about 36, 37 C. So what would you use for a pancake 0 0.9? Ooh, cherry wood. Um, that just depends. So the LDO pancake motor is a 1.8 amp motor. I typically run at around 800 to 900. Uh, gearing does help your motor run with less current because it needs less torque to move things. But that's a whole nother lesson. That's a whole lot of... This is getting to be very involved. Um, <laughs> we're done with that. We're done with this. Uh, if you're running a 5160 or 2130, you need to activate the used SWSPI mode because it doesn't use UART. Um, UART and SPI have conflicting... Not conflicting. There's, there's a, They're not... SPI is technically better than UART because it's faster, but UART is unidirectional. SPI is one way. UART means that there's a chip on the stepper driver and on the board that talk to each other. SPI just means that the chip uh, on the board on the processor or chip on the stepper is sending information. Um, it doesn't mean that anything is talking back to it. Uh, I don't need this. Stealth chop on all of these is interesting. So if you have a 2208 and you're running uh, linear advance, disable stealth chop on the E. You typically don't need stealth chop on the E. All stealth chop does is that's that 256 uh, micro stepping mode. That's very quiet. Um, this enables it, and we definitely want that enabled on the X, Y, Z, and E. Our chopper uh, voltage thingies. All we have to do is change this to 24 volt because we have a 24 volt power supply. You can make it quieter by running the Prusa Mark III parameters, uh, but I will say that the uh, print artifacting is a little bit higher in my opinion when you change to their uh, version of 
um, not version, but to their uh, settings in the timer in the in the chopper algorithms. So just know to match this to the voltage that you have. So if you have a 12 volt power supply, I'll leave it at 12 volt. If you have a 24, 24. If you have 36, at a 36. That's all you need to know. I do enable driver monitor status, which just means I can use all of these fancy M900 commands and M122 to report back settings and such. Um, I also don't really enable hybrid threshold. You can. So all hybrid threshold means is it'll switch automatically from stealth chop back to spread cycle, which is a louder uh more powerful mode. So this is typically if you're losing steps at higher speed. So if you're trying to print faster and you're skipping steps and your prints are getting all messed up and a whole layer is shifted by five millimeters, you might want to enable this. So you can, it's not a big deal. I mean, you can set these values really high so they kick in. So you can be like at 120 millimeters per second, enable um, spread cycle mode. And you can do the same thing for the extruder when it ra you know, reaches above a certain speed. So this is up to you. Um, I'll enable it here and just run it as a test so we can show it to you guys. So I'll run some commands and show you how it's louder uh, when you go faster than 120 millimeters per second. So kind of neat. You can tune this however you want. Um, I don't normally do it because the 2209s are very powerful. They have the latest and greatest stealth chop so i've never had an issue with skip steps it'll like crush through a layer that's in its way more so than it will anything else so um stall guard here we go let's talk about sensualist homing so this is awesome um sensualist homing is the feature where we are crashing our extruder and our bed i love saying that we're crashing into the end to get it to stop. And this is the sensitivity part. So 0 to 255 on a 2209, on a 2130, or even like a uh, 5160 and so, you'd use negative 64 to 63. Uh, we're using 2209s, and I start at 100 and 100. That's kind of a little lower than the halfway point. So <coughs> what... How do I know what sensitivity to use? Very simple. Um, I'll show you on day four, or no, day three, when we actually load it in there, and I'll show you how to tune it. So, um, no M, nice N321 method. Oh, okay. Um, XTOL sensitivity and YSOL sensi sensitivity, you will tune once you load this firmware onto your printer and you home the axis for the first time. So I highly recommend when you first get your printer turned on, it's a turn on, you'll head over to uh, motion and you'll head over to each axis and make sure each axis moves in the, in the proper direction. After you know that each direction moves correctly, you will home each axis individually. So with the X axis, you will then go to motion and then home X. And it'll either stop and go the opposite direction It'll either move all the way to the end and stop like it should, or it'll move all the way and stop and continue to grind. Um, the best case scenario is it hits and it stops and you're good to go. The worst case scenario is it keeps going and keeps grinding. The uh, medium uh, preferred value is or <laughs> issue is that it stops and goes the opposite direction for a small moment, so it'll kind of stutter. Um, Stuttering is easy. That means your sensitivity is too high. It means that your value of your sensorless homing, your stall sensitivity is so high that the small motion is triggering the stall detection. So you would decrease the value in that instance. Um, so if we're at 100 and it you hit home and the x-axis stutters for a second and goes back a little bit, you would then decrease this value. So you would go to like 80 and try that. If, and the opposite is true, if it hits the end and keeps grinding, you would then increase this value. So go to like 120. If you go all the way to about 200 and it's still grinding, you need to lower your um, motors. You go back to your X axis and you change your home current lower. 
So that's basically, you know, the science behind tuning it. You get, you start at half your, your start your homing current about half your actual uh, current. You then run each axis and test each axis to make sure you can tune it using the sensitivity here. If you're using, if you're getting really close, like if I'm at 10, in order to hit and actually get a positive thing, you would want to increase your homing current. Uh, you don't want to be so close to the sensitivity that if you need to adjust it a little bit further, you can't. So just remember that these two values you'll tune directly from the screen. Uh, your motor currents, if you, your actual like homing currents, you cannot edit from the screen. Uh, that would be nice if um, Marlin would add that, but it's not there. I also highly recommend in enabling improved homing reliability, which if we read, it just turns the acceleration jerk way down. That way, when it's running the homing, it it isn't going to be moving at full pace. It's not moving at 100 millimeters per second and crashing into the end. It'll move it nice and slow and without a lot of jerk. That way, it can really tune in and make sure it reads that stall. Uh, you'll just notice that your homing is a little bit slower, which is fine. We don't need super fast uh, homing. We just need it to home and not grind and or pause and go the opposite direction. So that is your lesson on how to tune sensors homing. I'll probably just make a video on that when I have a printer in front of me. Uh, beta feature, square wave stepping. I enable that. Square wave stepping is very specific to TMC drivers. Um, what that does is it sends a square wave pulse, which is what the TMC drivers prefer, and you get smoother stepping. Um, it's in beta, but it works. TMC driver debug, definitely. And then we scroll down, and we're basically done. Like, everything else here is basically uh, we don't need. If you want to enable a photo G code, you can do that, and I'll actually use one of the pins to fire a camera. Pretty neat. Uh, scroll down further, uh, filament with sensor. Yep, we got that. We can we can put one of those on there if we wanted to. Uh, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Define custom G-code macros. I'm going to do an entire day of this, but I'm going to enable that. Oh, not this one. Sorry, not this one. Define custom user menus. I'm going to do an entire day of this because I have some cool stuff. So... Um, like you can see, there's already things like preheat label one, and it'll move preheat labels to here. You can make a third one and move it in here. I do something like um, um, nozzle change. And you can do, so G28 is home, and you have to have the end key for the next line. So you can do G21, G28 home, and then, um, let's see here, G1, F2000 uh, X will move to 125 and then Y will move to 110 and Z will move to 100 and boom and N and M and one oh oh boy this is where my brain doesn't work anymore preheating the nozzle and the bed is it m109 or m190 that's the fun part so let's go over to here this is my marlin g code g code M104 is the hot end. So M109 will work. So M109 S270. So that will preheat our nozzle to 270. And that's it. So basically the nozzle change will home, then move the extruder to the middle of the bed and a higher up, and then or move the Z up to 100, and then it will... Um, increase the nozzle temperature to 270 degrees so you can change the nozzle. So you can add whatever custom features you want in here. I'm going to do a day on this because I have a bunch of them and they're very specific to some of the other settings we've done. So stay tuned for that. But other than that, I think I am good on configuration ADV.h. Um, 
I'm going to show you in tomorrow's video, I'm going to show you how to take settings from another config and import them quickly. I'm going to show you how to work on more of these fancy settings and what the ones I've added do. And I'll show you some other stuff. And then we'll also install the firmware onto a printer and run things and test it. So, um, yeah. I think we're good today. Anyone got any questions before we end today's fancy goodness? Heading back to camera. Anybody with any questions? I see there's 23 of you puzzled humans on the other side going like, I'm still confused about stepper currents and essentialist homing. <laughs> Trust me, I'm still confused on it. I just get it because I have to mess with it every Every day. Every day. <laughs> At least my printers are all printing in the background. Well, not all of them. Just four of them. This one this one I'll get printing here in a second. I have to print a new new thing. Yeah, if you have an actual Bowden extruder, so if you have like a CR ten or an Ender that has a full Bowden or a mini full Bowden, um, there are settings that would change um, based on it being a Bowden. Actual Bowden, not reverse. Yeah, you rewatch it, Alien 3D, Mr. Josh Man. Twenty viewers, three people left. They're like, oh, I'm good. I have learned enough. Or I'm so confused now that I've left. There is a lot less in configuration advanced.h or adv.h. But there are, they are a little bit more involved, and you need to know a little bit more about 3D printers and 3D printing in order to get your settings tuned the way you want them to be tuned. So, I know Josh has some fancy features on his Tesseract that need some fancy gizmo gadgets done to it. But, yeah, I'll, I'll grab Slimer tomorrow. I'll bring him over here. And we'll print, um, um, I'll print, uh, I'll not print, I'll take the firmware, move it over there, show everyone how to tune. Uh, I guess I'll use this program to do it because then I can get the little close-up camera on the screen so you can see what I'm doing on screen and I can hit the overhead, overhead button or go full overhead so I can do things. So... I can even have the microscope camera, but I don't have it hooked up at the moment, so. Yeah, I bet you it's been fun getting things to work, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have updated TFT firmware if you need it. You have the TFT 3.5? Like, go to my GitHub, and I've got my GitHub, my links down, down there. No problem, Sheriff. Or is it Sharif? Ooh, M5 and Mini Oops. Yeah, I decided to do mini, uh, the Mini Oops as its own own day, because that's just wiring it and doing all that fun stuff. So, um, yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, stay out of trouble. Stay home. Uh, don't get sick. And uh, happy modding, because modding is the spice of life. It is the sliced bread of 3D printing. <laughs> Not really, but yeah. On that, everyone have a great time. Thanks for staying in here. Um, yeah, I have all the new unified menus and graphics. I even have one that is really sexy. It, it mimics the Prusa Mini buttons and graphics. I have a green one, too, if you need a green one. I'll see if I can build the green one. No, Techie Dad. Um, you cannot use just a regular PWM pin. Um, you need um, a strong 5-volt five, five um, so if you have an SKR 1.3, the only way to do it is to steal the 5 volt from servo. Um, cause you need a dedicated 5 volt. PWM won't run. Um, you'll, you'll blow your board. Um, if you try to run it, if you have an SKR 1.4 or the E3 mini, it has a dedicated NeoPixel pin, which has a dedicated 5 volt. Um, and you can actually add an extender. There's the... See if I got one. Yeah, you can add this the DC DC bridge, which the DC DC bridge 
steals more five volt as I drop it almost on the floor. Yeah, MKS Gen L won't have a dedicated. So this this DC DC, if you're running more than eight uh, Neo pixels, will steal some five volt off of twenty four. So it's basically like a mini buck converter to give you enough juice to power them. You will blow your board trying to run it like on an end stop pin. Um, I looked into it the other day because like, oh man, I want to put it on my one point three. So this printer has a SKR one three on it. Um, and then I realized I have to steal my servo pin. So then I move my BL touch. I, I basically move my probe to a whole nother pin in order to use the servo pin. Cause you need five, you need a steady five volt to run the NeoPixels. Um, PWM won't run it. Um, PWM is neat, but it won't run that. Cause it needs like a MOSFET and something like that. So, um, yep. Don't start throwing ne NeoPixels on your MKS Gen L. You can run them through like your Pi. So if you have a Raspberry Pi, you can run uh, NeoPixels through the Pi, and it'll you know when you run a print, the Pi will turn on the lights. Um, you can upgrade to uh, a one four, which is the exact same board size and and hole layout as an MKS Gen L. So there won't be any like you know there won't be you know any real changes for you in terms of fitment. So it just where the wires go is a little bit different. So anything else before I run away into the land of eating dinner? Because well, not really dinner. Late lunch, early dinner. I had breakfast today, and that's it. I had I had a pancake, two pancakes, and two sausage turkey sausage rounds. Because I didn't feel like eating yogurt for breakfast today. I really should have. <laughs> but chat slow down. We added one more viewer. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I should really get these shirts out to people. I keep forgetting I my local print shop. I made like a hundred of these a few years ago. So. All right. Stay out of trouble. Happy modding. I will see you. I'll post a link to tomorrow's stream, which will be actually loading the firmware to the new printer and some other stuff. I'm copying some settings using a different software. So. Good night.